Arnold chapter 2. The reading for the week 2 workshop was Arnold chapter 2. It's all about how historians have to choose between options they have and be selective and what they use. And it runs through some of the difficulties that you face when you're doing history of any type. And they all apply to accounting history. If you've got more than one source then, and the chapter opens with this example relating to the peasant revolt. If you've got more than one choice, you tend to focus on the one that fits what you're doing or what you're hoping to achieve best. That's the instinctive reaction, if you like. But what is what you need to do in reality is to look at the choices you have and try and reflect on their content, note the inconsistencies and try and resolve them so that you end up with a synthesized idea of what they are describing. So for example, if you look at the Florentine banker's ledger from 1211. There are three transcriptions of it that were published within a few years of each other. And they're different because the authors did different things with the abbreviations in the original text. Anyone using the transcript has to use all three if they're going to do it properly and decide which of the alternative choices made by those authors is more appropriate. Each, per, each source that you have on something will give you a different perspective. If you pick up a newspaper Pick up four newspapers and look at the front page. They're all talking about what happened yesterday. But they all have different things on the front page. Some have a lot about something, some have very little about that thing. Some don't have anything at all. You need to try and work out why that is the case in order to set the each of those articles in context. But if you want to know about one of the topics that are on those front pages, you don't just take one of those articles, you take all of them that talk about it. And some of them will have articles about that topic inside the newspaper, not on the front. If you watch the evening news on television, you could watch the BBC News, the national news for the UK. You could use the Scot watch the Scottish news on BBC. You can use the STV news on, on television. You could use Sky News. And you can look at the news programmes from all over the UK by just going to one of the regional TV station channels. You have all these sources telling you what's going on and you have to decide which one to use or which ones to use and pick out from them the things that really matter. In order to do this with history, where you're dealing with things that are maybe hundreds of years old, you need to develop different ways of interpreting, viewing and understanding. You need to learn to look at something in its context. You can't just pick up four newspapers and compare them and be very successful at doing that in order to arrive at an overall perspective on what they describe unless you know what was going on around them, around the events that they describe. So if you go back 200 years in England, in Britain, you'll find weekly newspapers, daily newspapers, magazines, all talking about what's going on in the world around 
wherever that publication is based, the country, the town, whatever. But in order to understand what's inside them, you need to know more. You need to be able to identify those things that are most important. And then if you flip it on its head, you need to think about which of those accounts, which of those descriptions really makes sense. And why is something missing from one and included in another? So it's not easy when you have multiple sources to decide what's important and what's not. And the historian has to make a choice. And that's why if you go and read on the history of Europe from uh, 1200 to 1500 and you read about it in four different books you'll come away with four different ideas about what it was that happened in those centuries. The next thing that was covered was where do you find your sources and I, I went into sources quite a bit in the week two lecture video. It's if you're looking at things that have been written, there's a selection process that takes place where things get weeded out. And sometimes there's no editorial involvement, so there's no weeding out. So where do you find your sources from? Well, the primary source is always the best one, and any historian anyone doing any investigation of any type wants primary sources. A police investigation today wants to speak to witnesses, it wants to see videos filmed today near the scene. It wants to talk to the people that were there and see the primary evidence, the initial original evidence it doesn't want to report written by a journalist as its only source, because that's secondary. So they want the primary sources. It's the same in history. Within sources, you have problems with language. Sometimes the language is clear, sometimes it's ambiguous, sometimes it's misleading. Sometimes it's foreign. And languages change over time. So the further back in history you go, the more likely it is you're going to come across words that you think mean X when they actually mean Y. And you'll see an example of that when we talk about Pacioli's uh, treatise and his manual on double entry bookkeeping in a week or two's time. Some writing is formulaic. And because it's formulaic, you're able to identify the things you really want. If, for example, you look at a bill of exchange, a medieval bill of exchange, you'll always find the key things in the same place. Bills of exchange were invented by Florentine bankers and they established the sequence that things should appear and where they should appear. So even if you can hardly make out what the writing means, you know where to look. And once you start looking, you'll find what you need. And you'll also find the same text repeated time after time. It's sort of a label that's telling you what comes next is what this is about. What comes next is what this is about. If you look at a journal of a Venetian business in the 15th century, an international business, a wholesale business, you'll see that the sequence of the items in the entries are very consistent. The first item is always um, the debit, and the second is always the credit. And the location of the contra entry is always at the end of the narrative. If you look at a Florentine journal entry, the terms used are slightly different and the sequencing is different. So depending on where you are, if you know the, the sequence, it can help you to interpret or understand what you're looking at, even if it's in a foreign language. And in a language that's long since uh, been replaced by a more modern equivalent, just with the passage of time. 
there are problems and issues with handwriting, which is why I uploaded to my Aberdeen those two pages out of the 1475 manual on double entry bookkeeping. It's written in what is called Mercantesca script, which is the handwriting that was used by merchants. They learnt it um, as they were growing up and they just kept using it. So you see it in account books throughout the Middle Ages and into the, the period afterwards, which we call early modern period after 1504, about 1800, 1850, something like that. But it's a very distinctive handwriting. There was a handwriting that was used in the late 19th, early 20th century, in fact, middle 20th century, called shorthand. Uh, secretaries, typists used it. And it allowed them to write very quickly. But it was just very similar in concept to the Mercantesca script that you see in those two pages from the Double Entry Bookkeeping Manual. Anyone who could write that way could read it. It wasn't a secret, there was no code in it. Nowadays, if someone wants to read a 15th century Venetian ledger, they need to go on a very detailed course. It might take three months of intensive training to be good enough at it to be able to do that. So looking at the handwriting of the evidence you got, if it's, a, if it's not easy to read the handwriting, you're looking for information, you're looking for evidence in your source, it can be easy to make a mistake. It can be easy to interpret something the wrong way, to give a meaning that isn't intended. When you come to formal documents, like uh, letters, the chapter talks about them. How there was a period when letters in medieval Europe, when letters had a certain structure. There were five sections, and the five sections always contained one particular piece of information. So if you have, let's say you had 20 different letters from one person to another about business, you'd always know where to go to find out the key points you need. You don't need to read the rest. It's always going to be in one place. The chapter then went on to chronicles. Now, chronicles are personal accounts. It's a, it's a style of writing that effectively still exists, but you'd see it now in the form of video diaries rather than the way it was hundreds of years ago. But a chronicle is an eyewitness account. And there's some very famous ones going back hundreds if not thousands of years. But you read a chronicle and you get that person's opinion of what that person is seeing. It's like if I'm watching um, a game of football, soccer, I might think someone's uh, committed a foul or a penalty should be awarded or that someone should be sent off whether a goal should be awarded. And the person sitting next to me might completely disagree and both of us are convinced we're right because we are seeing something through our own eyes and everyone is subjective. So we interpret things and the way we interpret them depends on what we ourselves know. And in history, that can be a real problem. So if you look at, um, say, a, a, an account book from the 14th century and you have in your mind what it should look like and it does not look like that, you'll just ignore it. That's what happened to those Florentine bank accounts from 1211. The accounting historians of the 20th century, or the first half of it, looked at it, decided it wasn't really all that interesting because it wasn't really about accounting as they wanted it to be, so they just wrote it off. And then you get someone else came in, you got a lawyer, legal historian came in, and you got, eventually, a medieval historian who was Geoffrey Lee came in and had a look. And you also had um, people like Federico Melis, who was the leading Italian, um, really a business historian of the middle of the 20th century, and he had a proper look. 
But he never said it was double entry, and neither did Geoffrey Lee, because they didn't see what they were looking for. They didn't see it. But the medieval law professor who looked at it before anyone else, virtually, he could see it was double entry because he had a much more open mind. So if you get a chronicle, it's the same sort of thing. The chronicler is writing about what he or she is seeing. And they might see a fight 10 metres away from them. And they might see someone getting injured in the fight. And someone else is writing about the same event but was 100 metres further away and never saw the fight. So the fight perhaps dominates the first chronicle of the second, and it's not in the second one at all. And the example that's given in the book is of that type. When you read a chronicle's account, it's written for a specific audience. Things are assumed. It's assumed you know what X means or Y means. You don't have to. Be, they don't have to be explained. Things that are assumed won't be mentioned. You read someone else's account, which is for a different audience, which isn't so knowledgeable on those things that the first writer knew all about. We'll explain them. We'll describe them. Now, some people would look at the first one, which doesn't have those explanations and descriptions, and think, well, that's not a very helpful account. No one will really benefit from that. And look at the second one and think, that's really helpful. Everyone will have understood that. But the second one might be very, very narrow-minded, tunnel-visioned, and not very helpful at all. The first one, on the other hand, skips past all the routine because he doesn't have to explain it and goes into a lot of detail about very interesting things which are totally missed by those people who prefer the one that explains in it, apparently everything. A chronicle can be misleading, not just because it's biased by the, the viewer's own eyesight, but it might be deliberately misleading. The, the person who made the account might be wanting to trick someone into thinking something happened when it didn't, or something didn't happen when it did. You hear about people giving false witness and people do that. They, they perjure themselves in court. They're telling a tale, which is effectively a chronicle, about what they saw. And they will deliberately mislead the judge and the jury by saying something that's not true. And these chronicles, which might be very long, might be an entire book, and there are plenty of examples of them. And there's one or two very famous ones about medieval Italy. You've got to be able to pick between what's true and what's not, what's likely to be true and what's likely to be not, to be false, and select what's really important. Sometimes you read a chronicle and it's fiction. It's been written by someone pretending to be someone else. And those are a problem for historians because sometimes with the passage of time it's very difficult to tell what is a legitimate um, chronicle and what is one just invented by someone who wanted to be mischievous because it doesn't have a label and it says this is a fabrication. We, in the absence of any evidence to the contrary, have to assume it's factual or as factual as much as it can be from someone else's perspective. And the only way you can discover if that's not the case is if you look at the surrounding context, which will tell you whether or not it could have happened, might have happened. And again, there's, there's good examples of that. When I was working on the translation of that bookkeeping manual from 1475, the Italian archivist I was working with said to me very early on, he said, I think this is fake. And he explained why, and he was giving me those sort of explanations. But it was possible to to cross-check the things in it, which so it definitely wasn't. But at first sight, it appeared it might be, because it was very similar to something that was published in print 50 years later. You get mistakes, 
and you get distorted facts. So, for example, you get a report of a big battle, you'll be told there were X number of thousands of people killed as it was in the Battle of Monteperti. There's no reason to believe those numbers. They were just a lot. And they put a number on it. But you'll see other people come along and they'll cite it and they'll say there was at least a number that were killed. When the reality might be there were only half that number, a quarter of that number, that were actually um, suffered that fate. He then talks about charters, which are really legal contracts, and the importance that they have um, one sort or another. And, and he sort of dwells on that side of things for quite a while, towards the end. Um, things like, he talks about, if you go back into the medieval period, you can find examples of, of court cases being brought where the purpose is not to gain any recompense from someone. It starts to get a record in an official document that you have this agreement with someone else. There was a time uh, in England in the 13th century when this was something people would routinely do. And because um, it was important to get a legal record of any contract you entered into in case uh, the other party didn't deliver on it. And a lot of people use legal records. It's as was mentioned in the, the book, an awful lot of people use account books and account records from the 12th century right through to the modern day when they're looking at history because it provides all the information about trade and the things that were traded. And when you go into domestic bookkeeping, you get all the information about what people ate, drank, you know, purchased, sold, just in their day-to-day -day lives. So social historians use account books a lot. Historians in marketing use account books a lot. Economic historians use account books a lot. So do business historians. And you can just go through the whole range of disciplines. Account books are a fundamentally important source. And why is that? Well, one of the reasons is that in double entry bookkeeping, you record everything. Absolutely everything. That's the whole purpose of double entry bookkeeping. And that's why it's become the de facto way to do bookkeeping and the foundation for all the accounting that you see done. But it's an information source, massive information source, all secondary, but particularly in the medieval period, it often pointed to where the evidence could be found. And the historian has to choose from all the evidence what's what's best to use. And the account books were a good source because they were a legally binding document when prepared in double entry, so people trusted them. And it was not easy to lie in an account book. So that's really chapter two. And the message is that it's very important to be careful with the sources that you use. If you're looking at literature sources, and you've got two or three telling you different things, you need to be able to work out which one you can trust. And once you can do that, you can start to develop a true understanding of what was going on. However, the only way to really choose between sources is to know the context, to understand what was going on around what was being written, and to understand the context of the writer of the source. Why did that person write that? And when you know those two things, you're a long way along the road to knowing if your source is valid or not. So that's it. And that's really what Arnold Chapter 2 is about.